Hello. Um, I think most of you will have seen Lisa when she's turned up at sort of our branch meetings occasionally. Um, like a bad penny. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say that. Um, Lisa is our volunteer <laughs> organiser. She's um, the one that the committee reports to <laughs> keeps us in line. Um, we've got another meeting with her after this one about next year. Um, Lisa volunteered to talk to us um, about one of her her passions, one of her hobbies. So can I hand over to you, Lisa? Yeah, you can. I'll, Thank you very I'll, much. I'll put you on spotlight. Yeah, because then I've got, I've got show and tell. So, yeah, thank you. I hope you can see it all right. I've had to close my curtains because it's too much sunlight. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you for having me here this morning. I will just say I really endorse what Hannah does. She came and did a, a fundraiser for me once, and I did her exercise classes and her line dancing, and she's brilliant. So um, it was nice that she got you all warmed up because, actually, I'm going to put you through some military exercise now. No, I'm not really. <laughs> um, so what I thought I'd do this morning is I've... I've um, it's my husband and my son, well, it's, as a family, we're interested in World War I, um, particularly, and World War II, to be fair. We used to travel to France a lot and go around the cemeteries, as, as I'm sure some of you will have done. And, um, you know, we never had a relative that we could pay our respects to until my father passed away and I got the family brown suitcase, as you do, and started to look down the family tree. And it turns out that my great granddad um, who is here, um, Arthur J. Adams, my, the little girl sat on his lap was my nana um, and he um, went to France and was there five months and was killed in the Battle of Luce, which the Battle of Luce is the first battle where they actually used gas. Um, so it then became a bit of an obsession as a family. So I don't collect this stuff. I mean, you can see some of it's on here. Um, I, they collect it, I just have to dust it. It's like living in a museum in some of my rooms, trust me. So what I thought I'd do is rather than sit here and just talk lots, I'll do a bit of a, we'll do a bit of a show and tell kind of thing. If you've got a pen and paper handy, um, I thought I would show you some articles, uh, objects, and then you can tell, you can write down what you think it is, and then we'll go through the articles if that sounds okay. So that's better than me keep talking. So has everybody got, is everybody ready? Got a pen and paper? Yeah. Yeah. So the first, can you see this one? So this is, this is the first object. So just write down what you think it is, and we'll go through the answers at the end. If you can't see any of them, just say. So that's number one. Do you think it is? No idea. <laughs> no idea. Someone just said no idea. <laughs> Number two. Number three. I've got to get off my chair. <laughs> Number three is this. Very heavy. Gun isn't it? For those of you that aren't on mute, for those of you that aren't on mute, you are giving people clues. I'm just mentioning that, but that's fine. I don't mind if you don't. It's only a bit of fun. Um, number four is this. Do you want me to put everybody on mute, Lisa? I don't mind. No, it's okay. Fine. Yeah, that's fine. So that's number four. It's got a really sharp end to it. Number five is this, and it does whatever way you put it, it has that lovely spike on it. That's for puncturing vehicle tires. <laughs> Number six <laughs> are these, which I'm sure you'll know will be World War One medals, but what are they called? What's then what's their nickname, shall we say? <laughs> Number six, no, number seven we are on now is this. What do we think this is? I think that's a corkscrew. Yeah, it's, it's, my, it's for my size of kind of wine bottles. Um, <laughs> eight is this. What's this? <laughs> Might be an old hand grenade. That's a more modern hand grenade she's got. Number seven. 
number we on nine is this I think there's one is it number ten is this do we know what this is what is it I mean we know it's a gun don't we obviously or oh, rifle got but do we know which sort? I did get told off by a World War II veteran for calling it a gun once. It's not a gun, it's a rifle apparently, and I should make sure that I always say that, bless him. Um, number 11. Is that? Number 12 is this. Oh yes, it has got things in it. Number 13, I'll have to put this over here because if I break it, I'll be in real big trouble. It's glass, I don't know what this is. Don't just put a bottle because we... <laughs> and then... The last one is, what is this? What is this called? So it's got, it doesn't normally come a wire across it because it's hung on the wall normally. So that's it, number 14. So I hope you've had a little, a little guess at that and then we can do a bit of a reveal. So I'd just like to point out that everything I'm showing you is original. So everything I'm, I've got is over a hundred years old, which is pretty amazing, some mm. of them. So you can shout out the answer if you know. So what do we it's think? Really about? Buttons. It yeah. is, it's a button polisher for those that didn't know. So you put it on your uniform, put it on your button and give them a good polish. Can't believe, can you, that when they were in the trenches up to their eyes in mud, that they had to put the buttons on their coat. What about these? The wire cutters? Yeah, that's right, wire cutters. These were the ones that went on the belt, so they hung on the belts and then they opened them like this to have a look at the top at the wire. And then they had other ones like this as well, which were longer ones. Um, yes, there were wire cutters. The shell, you don't have to pick that up again, you can see that just there, can't you? So do we obviously know it was a shell? Do you know what, you know, what what would it be blown from? I don't, see, I'm not very good with the technical terms. I'm not sure what I mean. <laughs> it was an eight, that was an 18 pounder shell. And that would be on something like this. So you can all see that. Wow. So, um, and obviously that had quite a bit of backlash when they, when they actually <laughs> sent them on their way. And we've got inside it, it looks like on. this. So you've got these are the, this is the, that was what would be sprayed on it when it exploded. Um, sure. On the battlefields, and we've walked them, I don't know if you can see, but those bits at the top, we've actually picked them up. So we've got we've got lots of those that we've found on the battlefields when we've been on our walks. Um, this does anyone know what this is? Very sharp on the end. Describing describer. No, it's metal. There's another sort like this. It's for cleaning your gun from an out. It's describer. These are called flashettes. They're metal, different sorts. I think these are German ones. And what they used to do with the old um, airships, they used to drop them from a great height. And actually they could pierce through one of the steel helmets. No. But the thing is, they made such a noise, the airships, when they come along, that everybody just got out of the way. So they weren't that effective really, but they did cause some serious injury if you did happen to get one hit you on the head. What about this? Well, that's for puncturing tyres. Puncturing tyres. Do you think they had many cars in World War One? Oh, they're horses. Who said that? I'm very impressed. Hey, Barry. Well, I'm very impressed. You are right. It's a cool throp, and they were dropped. They were dropped on the floor to try to make the horses lame. I mean, sometimes they had them in boards like this, where they'd attach them all to a board and then put some straw or grass over it. Um, but 
as the horses are merrily trotting along, they come across one of these in their hooves. It doesn't matter how it falls, it always falls with the spike up. So yeah, that's a cool crop it's called. A bit nasty, isn't it really? I guess it would have done the soldiers quite a bit of damage as well if they'd have trodden on one too, but it was mainly to sort of immobilise the guns what being called. Again? What was it called again? A cool throp. It's called a cool throp. Cool. A How do you spell that? And, uh, well, I could guess, but I'm not sure. It's just like it's like C A L T H R O P. I don't know if there's an E on the end or not, but that's what they are. Yeah. Oh, thank so, you. But pretty vicious things, I think. So there we've got the three medals. We've got the 90, 14, 15, if you signed up first medal, the war medal and the victory medal here. Who knows what their nicknames are? Pipsqueak and Wilfred. Pipsqueak and Wilfred. Who said that? <laughs> well done. Yeah, Pipsqueak and Wilfred, they're called. That's what they were called. So what do we think this is? Oh. A corkscrew for my wine? No. Mm -hmm. Any ideas, anyone? It's for stringing up the barbed wire. And the reason it looks, so the barbed wire would go on the top and this bit would go on the bottom. The reason they used to have straight, obviously straight posts to attach the wire. And then of course, what happens when you banging it in, you can get, you know, you give your position away, don't you? So by having these at the end, they were able to screw them in without making any noise and then attach the barbed wire. It's a pretty clever idea, isn't it really? For over a hundred years ago, you know, I think. We did actually buy this. We'd see loads of these in fields. We didn't steal it because it's been tempting at times. Um, what was next? Number eight. Grenade. It is a grenade. It's a cricket ball grenade. And these were used um, in 1915 when my great granddad would have used these. Um, the only problem with it, it was something like you could throw them, throw them 25 meters. But they, when they exploded, they had a range of 35 metres. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they weren't the best. And they are, it is quite, it, look, it is as heavy as it looks. So, yeah. So they decided to develop and eventually they got to this. Most people will know what one of these. The hand grenade. The hand grenade, you know, what's, what sort. It's very famous. They're still used now. Mills. Oh, Mills no. bomb, yeah, was that you, David? Yeah, Mills bomb. They, um, they manufactured 75 million between April 1915 and late 1918, 75 million. Um, and it was, you know, the most powerful grenade. Um, and they, they, would they would carry a couple of them at a time, the infantry men. Um, and also they could be fired out of um, rifles as well and put on a rod and fired out of a rifle. That's so, right, my husband's just walked in the kitchen. I think he's checking up to see if I'm saying the right stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay apparently I can carry on okay um so this what year was this 17 1917 this was an original Lee Enfield Lee Enfield mark three somebody said brilliant with the bayonet on the end which would have caused somebody serious mischief wouldn't it just a little story about Lee Enfield my aunt lived in Enfield in a street called Ordnance Road and at the end of Ordnance Road, by the river, by the River Lee, is where those those rifles were manufactured. Oh, yeah, that's, it, a, lot, that's a little that's claim. Right. I used to work there. No, yeah, Who's... Royal School Arms in Enfield. Did you? Wow, what's a small Enfield. world, isn't it? The father worked there before me. <laughs> Goodness me. That's a, that's amazing. So you might have made that not yet because you're not you're not. Did you get fired? <laughs> this is what Kieran. Can you shut the door, please? This this is my this is my son's passion. He likes the rusty stuff. So when we go, there's a couple of collectors in Belgium, and he 
He likes the stuff that's just been picked up off the ground, look, and we just treated a bit. And you might be able to see, you may or may not be able to see, this is a rusty um, rifle, like I've just showed you, but it's half cocked. So this is why my son likes it, because he sits in it like this and he looks at it. It's still got some of the wood in the, you know, in the end here. And he's like, so this poor soldier that was holding this possibly was trying to reload his rifle. You know, did he survive it or didn't he? You know, that's a real part of living history. So he, he collects a lot of that. Um, so I have even rustier stuff in my house, as you can see. What's this? It's always, this always causes some really good answers. Is this a water bottle? It is a water bottle. It's oh. not a wee bottle, because I've had that said I don't know how many times, but it's, it's a French one. Same difference, I suppose. Yeah, it is, and, and this, was a, this was a British one. Not big enough. Nice one, but much <laughs> so yeah, that's what that was. What about this? Yeah, we have one of those. Christmas tin from Queen Mary. Look, somebody's got one. Yeah, I can see. It is the Christmas oh, tin. Have you got bits in yours? No, sad. It was my grandfather. Oh, well, that's a lovely thing to have. So, in, in that was love. That's a lovely thing to have. In yeah. twenty, you can actually pick the bits up for them. I mean, we bought this more or less complete, but. In 2014, 100 years to the day, that these were given. So the 1914 Christmas, these were given to the to the soldiers, and it was like because it was like they're going to be home soon, weren't they? So <laughs> home at Christmas, weren't they? 100 years to the day, I bought my husband one of these, and when the Queen did her speech, she got one on her on her table at the side. So they had two sorts. Does anybody know what you had in them? Because there was two that they did. <laughs> Cigarette. Yeah, one had chocolate and a notebook, a little notebook and a pen, which we can't find. And do you know what the other one had in? Yes. Cigarette. Cigarette. Tobacco. Tobacco. Cigarettes and tobacco. Yeah. So in here, there's some 1914 tobacco. It's still in there. Really? Really? And in here... There's a 1914 cigarette yeah. that's still in there. And then they'd get given a photo of Princess Mary and they'd be given this little card um, which says, with best wishes for a happy Christmas and a victorious new year from Princess Mary and friends at home. Oh, no, she that's what they get. So that's... Well, I'm six years old now, so we have got a couple of the spare ones, but you can pick, sometimes pick the bits up from, but we haven't found the chocolate, funnily enough, I guess that was all eaten, wasn't it? So. Who was Princess Mary married to? Who was Princess Mary? That's a good point. Who was Princess Mary? What? I've got mine. I had one of these my mother put in. What? And it's yes. all about Princess Mary. So um, what can you tell us about Princess Mary? Gosh, now you see. Um, she was 17 at the time and she headed an appeal for a hundred thousand pounds to buy a glass box containing other difficult to hear. Can you not hear? I can hear you now, yeah. She, so she, she did an appeal for a hundred thousand pounds to provide a brass box containing either tobacco or cigarettes. And lighter or sweets and chocolate she distributed all allied groups. So she, she was the head of her father, George V, on the box. But he insisted that her profile should appear on the list. Well, that's lovely. So what? What this? What? Um, what you're saying? It like so? She did this appeal, and she wanted to set hundred thousand pounds and send these yeah. boxes. And her, hus her husband, her father was George V. Yeah. And she wanted his his head on the box. Yeah. But he insisted that she had hers on there because it was her uh, idea, and she. Yeah. Loved that. Well, I've right. learned something today. So there you go. I hope you all. That's that's, that's really good. That's lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Across the screen. Um, do we know what this is? 
This is very special to me, this. Anyone know? No. This is an, a, an original gas bottle that they, they used at the Battle of Loos. So it's spelled L-O-O-S. I was, you know, Loos, we used to call it for ages, but it is supposed to be said Loos. And um, say so this was the first battle that they used the gas. And um, on the morning, they'd been bombarding the Germans for a while. And on the morning, they thought, um, it was a little bit windy, but they kind of like licked the finger and went, oh, it's not too bad. Let's go for it. Sent the gas, sent the men over the top, and a lot of the gas blew back into our own trenches. Wow. Now, there was like tens of thousands died on the day, but a lot of people think it was because of the back. It wasn't. There was only about eight and a half thousand, I think, um, that were injured or, you know, succumbed to the gas. The problem they got is they sent the first wave over. Um, and I went on the anniversary, 100 years to the day that my granddad um, had gone and I stood in the exact field because we'd worked it out from the battle plan and everything where he went over the top 100 years to the day. And in this field, we found this piece of rusty old rubbish, as I call it. And as you can see, it looks like you can see the, the markings of a shell here. And if you look this bottle would actually fit in that shell. So we actually picked that up a hundred years to the day. Um, makes me go goosebumps just telling you. Um, and my granddad was sent over the top in the second wave and they were told, yep, the German trench is clear, off you go. And they got off and they got almost to the trench and it wasn't, and they just got absolutely gunned down and massacred. Like there was just, it, it was just horrendous. As many of the battles were, Battle of the Somme and Passion Down and all of that. But, um, but that is, we managed to, we can't believe we managed to get one. Um, and then to find the, the piece of, on the actual battlefield was pretty amazing stuff. So yeah. They didn't use gas much more after that. Lisa? Yeah? Can I ask, what did they do? They carried them and threw them? No, these would be on in the shell like that. So they would be, I, I think they were shot out, like, you know, because they're in, these are quite heavy. So they're in a normal, they would be sent out like a normal shell, but rather than having the, the little bits of shrapnel in, the they would break. Yeah, the, okay. as landed, yeah, the bottle and shattered, the bottle would then oh, break. Right. And, okay. He, he died in that. He died in that assault, did he? Yeah. He didn't, he wasn't the first wave though, he was the second wave that went over and, and say, yeah, that's where he went. Well, was this mustard gas? Oh, David, you, we have looked it up before. Um, Nidge, was it mustard gas? It was the first gas. He'll Google it and tell you. We did, we have looked this up. I don't think it was mustard gas, it was something else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, pretty, I mean, I just, you know, there was loads of errors, weren't there, in, in the World War One, really. But, you know, that was like, oh, I don't know, it's a bit iffy, but we'll still do it. And you can read the war diaries now because they're all published. And, you know, you think, goodness me, they sent so many people to massacre, didn't they? So, mm -hmm. and then the last but not least is the very famous. Wait. What is it? What, what sort of helmet is it? Just... Tommy Helmet. Tommy Helmet. What's his other name? Brody. It's a Brody Helmet. Um, and, it, and we've got all the gubbins in here. Um, this is hangs on the wall with the rifle in the hall. So if anybody dares to come to my front door and I don't like them. Then Does I'll... the Brady name come from the manufacturer? Sorry? Is it the manufacturer's name? Brady. Brody, I think it was Brody. The, Brody. It was a Brody helmet. I've got this here. What does it say? He was the bloke who invented it. Mm. The voice from the other rooms just said. So John Leopold Brody. Um, it was a helmet design that could easily stamped from manganese steel with the pressing technology of the time and offer good protection from descending projectiles. Uh, went into serious production in October 1915, so my granddad wouldn't have had one of these, with the exception of, the, oh, there's 4,440 produced in mild, mild steel, but obviously they weren't as effective. Um, it was never protect, never designed to protect from gunfire, but to protect the head and shoulders from shrapnel. So, yeah, 
So they're all of the bits. They're not all the bits we've got, I will say. Um, we've got like, I haven't brought them down, I don't think. Oh, I've got one other thing to show you. Um, this is, wasn't on the guess and tell, but this, this is actually a torch that they had and I, we can put an old, there's a battery we can get that fits it and it does still work. And they had this on it look so that when, when you put it on the light shone down and they could look at their maps and they wouldn't give away their position. <laughs> We've also got binoculars and they were borrowed from civilians because they needed so many. They were given a special mark on, put on the binoculars when they borrowed it and it was all logged down. And after the war, they were then given back to the people that they borrowed them from, if they survived, obviously. And they had another mark, like a, it looks like a little bird's foot on there. So if you've got any old binoculars hanging around that have been passed down the family, you want to have a look and see if they've got a little mark on them, like a bird foot. And they were ones that would have been loaned out um, to people, so, <laughs> to, to soldiers. So how many did we get? Who got 14? <laughs> 13. 12? Did someone say yes to 12? No, 11? 10? No. <laughs> oh, well done, David. 10, that's brilliant. Um, that's not bad going, is it? 10 out of 14. I should have found some harder stuff, really. Um, <laughs> I did it one time, but I got rid of them all. Oh. I, I mean, small things I used to get. What sort of things? Uh, the tobacco tin you had there. Yeah. And I had a biscuit. One of these sort of uh, years old. It was like, <laughs> it was a biscuit they used to get given the rectangular size. Yeah. It was about two thirds of one biscuit. They kept it for ages. Took it up to Duxford School one day years ago. And they were interested to see it. But that's gone. Tuesday, oh. it was all about seven, eight years ago now. So it's difficult to read the detail. But I enjoyed collecting things that just found them in auctions usually. Yeah, they're a little bit more easy to get hold of, but more expensive nowadays. You know, I mean, we were doing this before the centenary, but I think from, you know, 2014, 2018, there was so much on the TV about it that people who were sort of semi interested have started, you know, to do it. Um, we do pick up, I mean, all of these are like, these are, things that we've just picked up from you know these are bullets and things that we've just picked up rusty nails I'm like I'm sure are they anyway apparently everything is authentic because I'm always saying well how do you know that's an old now how do you know but obviously bullets are quite easy um but lots of things that we just pick up um there's like this look this is a cone on the top of on the top of that shell you've got the cone bit so this was a smaller version of, of one of those that we just and, and my boys spend hours walking across the fields kicking that's what they call it and we did come across a round grenade one of the first days we got there um but it had still got the it had it did seem quite intact so they do have people that are still killed over in belgium and france there was a couple of years ago in eat um there was some builders killed because they dug, dug some footings and come across some bombs. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I mean, I hope you've enjoyed that. I yeah. do it like that so that you get to think, so I don't sit and talk. And as you know, I'm not an expert, you can tell that, but yeah. I do find it really fascinating. And I, I would urge any of you, especially like winter months with nothing to do, if you haven't gone on to ancestry and looked at your ancestors, because I've not just got my great granddad, um, I have got great uncles and one was a driver and he was in a really posh car at the time. Um, you know, I've found several relatives and we've been out to visit their, their, we've got one in a grave and the rest are all on walls. We've got one on the Menin Gate, if you've heard of that. Um, and we also took my husband's great uncles. They were, they were in the hole in the wall farm in church, Christchurch, sort of near Ely way. And he went and got some earth from the hole in the wall farms so that's there were two brothers that were killed and we went over to theirs one had got an unknown grave and one was stuck on the wall and we took some earth from home and took it and put it on their grave so we took we took them a piece of home back to them so but i would urge you if you haven't 
and you're interested, Ancestry now, you can very often get a free trial. You can really hook up into there and find out some really good stuff. And you can get, we've got service records. I know what my granddad's chest measurements were and what his sickness was and all of that. So it's really fascinating stuff, but it will take hours of your life. So be prepared. Um, but I hope you found that useful this morning. Very easy. Brilliant. Brilliant. I think that's been brilliant. Just, yeah. I was going to show you one one thing I've got from World War One. This was a bit of trench art. Yeah. Of one of Jan's um, great uncles that sits on pride of place, and it's beautifully inscribed. And you, think, you know, that's what they did to keep themselves occupied in the trenches. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, another call. Maybe you could do. I mean, the World War Two stuff as well. I've got my granddad's Gurkha knife. You know, so I think you know another another call. You could always do a if anybody's got something themselves to, to, to bring and show, couldn't you? So I hope you found that a little bit of interest and say it is a passion of ours and we just like to preserve it and keep it living and keep it, you know, keep remembering. Can I ask a question? Can I just say yeah, you can, something? You can ask a question. Schools to give this sort of talk because when I was teaching in Reading, we had every year because it was part of their GCSE curriculum he came in and demonstrated all sorts of different things. Yeah, we we have been in. Well, we have been into the school and we took and we let them and we like because we don't want it just sat in our cupboards. So we let them touch it and everything else until we turned around and one had got the bayonet and was like about to go at his friend's throat. And it was like, no. But yeah, um, we have been. We have been into schools and like heritage weekends and things. We want to, you know, we're happy. We've, got, you know, we've offered the we offered the Wisbech Museum at, at when there's the centenary as well. But always happy to do stuff like that if we're able to fit it in, because um, we want people to see it. And, and and it'd be nicer for me to come to you and for you all to be able to feel how heavy some of these things are, and you know, so you can really get the gist of how heavy was the rifle and then they had a bat then they had these wire cutters they're heavy then they had a couple of grenades and you know so wonder they weren't dragging on their knees when they tried to walk anywhere Do you have any paper uh, records or anything like that have i got any paper records i i, I got my grandfather's um training um manual for being a cook so not only is there information about what they actually were taught to prepare but also the sergeant's um, uh, record of uh, how well he did as a as a trainee cook, and also the name of a, a mate of his who was in a um, a bicycle brigade. Um, oh, that's good. Uh, that's bicycle that's, uh, brigade. Uh, quite interesting. But the point I want like to just make with you said that gas wasn't used much after the Battle of Loos. Well, my grandfather didn't actually go off to uh, war because of his age until 1917. He was he was a uh, uh, an established father of a young family um, and uh, basically uh, the, the situation there was that um, um, he uh, ended up being gassed in 1917. Not only did he get, get gassed but after recovering from the gas he was sent back again, got shot in the leg and was oh, then um, um, back on the boat. Uh, basically uh, wounded out uh, and the ship he was coming back on to the uh, UK in 1918 was the SS Waroga, which was a ship from South Australia, and that was sunk, and they lost 128 men on that uh, thing, but he, he survived, and uh, oh, I still have uh, the, uh, the, the uh, 1917, or, uh, sorry, after, after, after the 19, 1918 uh, Christmas, um, uh, um, embroidered... Um, Christmas so, party yeah. the family that was well, they were quite common. I think they were given to soldiers as something to take their minds off things. And what a lovely story. He was like a cat with nine lives then, wasn't he? Do you know what I mean? Like, extremely lucky, yeah. But then he was sent out to uh, to uh, after as soon as he was good fit enough, he was sent out to Dublin and was involved in the roundup of a uh, um what was it uh, um who was the guy uh, the Irish uh, prime minister or Valera. De Valera. De Valera. He was involved in, in, in uh, that uh, kerfuffle, so, uh, you know, he had a quite a, an exciting time, I think. The silk postcards are lovely, and my, my, this, my grandma, she, I've got one that her brother sent to her, love to all the children from your ever-loving 
somewhere in France from your ever loving brother George and I, I, I had that again had no idea who these people were until I discovered this opened up a whole new thing in my family history I didn't, I didn't know until a couple of months ago talking to a 90 odd year old uncle that my uh, grandmother uh, her contribution to uh, <laughs> she was a seamstress so she was spent she? a lot of her time actually stitching up aircraft before they were doped yeah, wow. uh, you know, uh, treated to uh, firm up the canvas and it's really I mean it's just such amazing thing it's good for to talk to family and then also but you in like anything that you know for you right down for your future generations because otherwise it just gets lost um if any of you are on Facebook I do run a World War One page called Soldiers Tales of the Great War and that has got just I want personal accounts of people not all the stuff that gets in books it's nothing more than just trying to get people to share their relative stories so we keep keep it captured I've got nearly 5,000 people following that page um so I can send that link you can send that out Keith if you want if anybody's yeah. interested they're welcome to join so Lisa I've got to say that's been an amazing fascinating um half an hour yeah. it's uh, it's flown by you you hide, you hide you hid that light under a very large bushel. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. And maybe when I'm allowed out, if I'm ever allowed out, I can just pretend I'm having a meeting about committee or something, and come and bring it, and you can all have a proper hold of lovely. it all at a later date. That would be lovely. I think. Can we give a round of applause to Lisa because I think that was really... Lisa. Thanks ever so much. Welcome. Any really time. really grateful. Um, I'd like it would be really good if you could drop in at our next meeting on is it the thirteenth, um, our Christmas festivities, which would be nice if you could. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll send you the link. Send send me the link. I'm sure yeah. I'll be able to. Okay. Um, is there anybody anything anybody else wants to talk about? Um, Can I just say something? Does please. anybody else remember wearing underwear made from silk parachutes? <laughs> wow. Have you got some still? Yeah. Have you, no, any... my mum used to make us all underwear out of silk parachute. <laughs> silk is oh, really that was quite nice though. I didn't We're understand the at the time, but then I suddenly realised later on. <laughs> well, I, I have my mother's wedding dress, which was made from parachute silk still. Oh really? Mm -hmm. When she made it, so it was absolutely wonderful. Who is that speaking? It's Mike. Mike. Oh. My mother as well, Barry's mother. Your mother as well, wow. I tell you, it's all the string bits that get in the way, that's the problem. <laughs> 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 Too much information, Ross. Yeah. Can you jump out of the tree, you're okay. Barry's getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay then everybody, um, let's pull it, pull it to an end. I think it's been a, a fascinating morning. Um, I'll send some notes out around the um the exercise um i'm recording the recording sort of the speakers so i shall edit the the recording and get that posted out to you on email or the link on the email in the not too distant future so thank you all for being here my sincere thanks to to lisa and to mike for organizing this <laughs> today um and we will see you all again in two weeks time is it 13th mike 11th i think 11th thank you oh. 10th and 11th 11th so we will communicate what's going on exactly and hopefully we'll have both the entertainer and a quiz running that day so I can I make a comment about the the um somebody made a comment uh, i think it was caroline said that maybe uh it was too long for 40 minutes or something with the uh guitar yeah. um yeah we, we'll we'll have two sets of 20 minutes or something like that. The comment that was made earlier on was that he was very versatile, so I would think 40 minutes would go quite quickly with a range of new, different musical styles and things. Um, yeah. I've <clears throat> I've listened to this guy. He <clears throat> he performed at the Cambridge Manor Strawberry Fair, and his 40 minutes just flew by. It was because he played such a wide repertoire of music and, and sang along to some of the stuff. It was... Um, over almost before it began, so I think splitting right. it two sets would be very good. Sorry, yeah. didn't mean to be bar humbug. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll talk to him beforehand. I just sort of yeah. uh, give him some uh, guidance as to what we'd like. 
That would be great, Mike. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. That would be great. Can we, can we actually, sorry, my voice is going, <clears throat> can we actually take Caroline seriously in that outfit? <laughs> I think you know, wait, till, you wait till the 11th and see what my t-shirt will say <laughs> well, I hope you change your tea towel by then <laughs> okay right then folks hey, everybody. thanks ever so much for joining in again thanks a lot Lisa and we'll, the committee we will see you in about half an hour yeah exactly see ya see you soon. Bye. oh by the way oh hang on Yes, that we should be asking Parkinson's whether well, Margaret, you were interested. You've seen other charities putting out um, displays or something, that, and you thought Parkinson's might think of doing that. Yes, like, it, it, it's something I've seen in the Grand Arcade, and they have a stand just to advertise themselves but there's a way in which you can present your debit card and it takes a fixed donation I think they have three pounds I'm not sure that's rather a lot for people that normally drop a pound into our tins but it seems to me that we've already come across people who say no I haven't got any cash and they haven't they've brought their card and there's going to be so much more of that now we none of us use cash for anything so I think Parkinson's ought to be finding a way in which we can get people's money without having to use cash. We Otherwise do. our collections are going to go right down. We have, um, we have, there is, there is a facility where groups can purchase a, a machine for cardless payments. It's just, it's a, the fee's about 30 pounds and it's just whether it, and then they charge a transaction fee. So there is that, it's called something in zit, zit, some beginning with Z, um, and there is yeah. that um, that has been sent out. They are looking at magnetic, but the buckets is what we really need. So you have a bucket that's got something where you tap your card on, and you, and that's how it pays. But they're too expensive at the moment. But that's one of the latest things where you just. But we have got where you can get your own little machine, so you can take contactless payments from people. So that is there. Yes. My, my my daughter is the finance director of a hospice in, in West Yorkshire, and they're using the buckets and the handheld devices. Um, they're tiny little things, um, and they're, they're very successful, very successful. So I, I would have thought with Parkinson's are working on that. Yeah. Yeah, because we've always done quite well on our collections, thanks to Caroline's organisation, and it's a pity to lose all that. And it'll be less, Margaret, you're right, because people won't want to touch cash at the moment, particularly with the virus around. So there is a facility that the committee can look to if they want to pursue that. And, you know, with the amount of fundraising you do, it would probably be worth the investment. Thank you. you we can't collect at the moment. Can't collect at the moment, no, Trish, without no. going through a ridiculous long flow chart, which... You don't want to be doing at the moment but yeah you know, i was i was looking ahead to when you know we come out of this which eventually we shall yeah, yeah. 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 We, have have waitress, <laughs> we have a waitress collection in april maybe we can make that for parkinson's awareness week yeah that would be great caroline to think they'll be in a position to do that by then wouldn't it let's cross everything <laughs> <laughs> bye everybody okay everybody thanks ever bye. so much bye, bye. bye.